Hello, everyone. This is Sarah Ochoa, and I have the pleasure of presenting the webinar today with Tyler Birhus. We will want to wish everyone on the call happy Physical Therapy Month. In honor of Physical Therapy Month, we are excited to present on the topic, translating rehab measures into high-intensity exercise dosing in the post-acute setting. There are a few housekeeping rules I want to go over with everyone. First of all, all lines will be on mute. Please use the chat feature for questions. Our moderator will be looking at these and uh, presenting them to both Tyler and I at the end of the presentation. Please inform the moderator through chat if you have anyone sharing your screen to attend the webinar. Please enter the email of those other participants in the chat feature. Course certificates will be sent to your email automatically within one to two weeks of the course. And the course content is about an hour long, but both Tyler and I will be available for questions following the presentation today. So Tyler, we're going to um, ask everyone the first polling question before we go into the objectives. And the first polling question that'll be pulled up for you is according to our associations, how long does it take translation of research to implementation into treatment strategies? And I'll give you all just a moment to answer. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and close that poll, Shyla. Okay, so our options were one year, three years, 10 years, or more than 10 years. And the answer is more than 10 years. So that means that today, in 2023, most of us are implementing assessments and treatment strategies that were new and exciting back in 2006 and 2009. So you can see there's a gap between knowledge to action or implementation and integration into the plan of care. And there you can see the responses. Most people thought three years or 10 years, and that's not unusual. Depending upon the resource, it can be anywhere from 14 to 17 years, which is pretty incredible. So today, we will be reviewing evaluation and assessment concepts that lead us to identification of patient underlying impairments. Once the impairment uh, has been identified that is affecting functional ability, We'll be discussing treatment strategies to address the deficit. Today, we'll be focusing primarily on exercise prescription and dosing. And then finally, we'll be looking to synthesize and apply strategies that facilitate continuity of care and teamwork, leading to successful implement implementation of high-intensity rehab for the geriatric population. And we hope to accomplish this through the case study. So why are falls so prevalent in the post-acute environment? Well, first of all, many of the points we're gonna be seeing pull up here impact balance and falls. The first of which is muscle weakness related to sarcopenia. Uh, the National Institute of Health reports that after age 30, we begin to lose as much as three to 5% muscle mass per decade. Some research even says up to 8% per decade. Researchers estimate that generally, those between the ages of 60 and 70 years old have lost 12% muscle mass, and those 80 years old and older, up to 30%. So you can imagine this muscle mass deficit that we begin to develop or lose will impact things like range of motion, will impact mobility and pain, will impact our body joint sense and space or proprioception. And we can't forget about cognitive impairment. That's another one that, although not related to muscle mass, affects falls in the post-acute environment. So which areas can we be impactful? Well, as physical therapists, we have within our scope of practice to address all these areas, which is pretty exciting. Yeah, the only thing I'll add to that too, Sarah, is 
you know, sometimes we look at these items on the screen and act, uh, ask ourselves, can we, can we change these specific items? And I think we can change and impact to some degree all of these, but even if we can't make a change or a specific impact on these deficits, we can certainly help provide meaningful uh, treatment interventions to our patients, whether it's through compensation or adaptation. Absolutely, absolutely. And to hit this, this point home even more, in March 2023, the uh, Centers for Disease Control and Fall Prevention, which is the next slide, indicated that more than one out of four Americans aged 65 years and older falls each year. Falls are the leading cause of fatal and non-fatal injuries in older adults. In 2020, over 36,000 adults age 65 and older died from preventable falls. And the cost of treating injuries caused by falls is predicted to increase to over $101 billion with a B by 2030. That's pretty significant. So I agree, Tyler, you know, to your point, there's a lot of physical therapists that falls within our scope of practice to be able to treat. So let's take another look at that in the next slide. One thing that our company, Aegis Therapies, was able to develop is we have this philosophy of restore, compensate, and adapt. On the horizontal axis there, you see just a snippet of functional mobility tasks or activities. And on the vertical axis, you see um, just a snippet of underlying impairments, areas of possible deficit that can affect those functional mobility tasks. We don't have this listed as a reference for you um, as a handout. However, this would be something that you could collaborate with your team to develop. We have one of these for physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech pathology. And therapists have found this really quite useful for just the things you indicated, how to remind us how big our scope of practice is as physical therapists and what areas we can work to be impactful for our patients. One of the things we have to remember as physical therapists is the ability to do an effective evaluation. I think so many times uh, with time constraints and other factors that challenge us throughout the day, we are sort of pulled in various directions. But with an evaluation, we need to begin to think about this as a review of the history, right? What was the onset? What was the mechanism of injury? I want you to think about the evaluation as our guide to choosing a clinical pathway. It's the guide leading us as to what type of assessments we need to do for our patients. So in evaluation, think about it as that guide leading us to what kind of assessments we need to be choosing to provide this patient. So the next slide. So how important is the assessment? Well, it's gonna help us identify that underlying impairment. So where the evaluation helped us choose a clinical pathway, the assessment's going to help us identify the impairment. It's going to help us identify the structure. It's going to help us identify what system or systems are being affected. Some examples of assessments that we can do specifically for the frail adult are listed here. And please know that these are not all inclusive. This is just a, a small a uh, number of things that we often see specifically in the post-acute environment. But we can do things um, like a six-minute walk test. We can do a BERG. We can do the modified CTSIB, which stands for Modified Clinical Test for Sensory Integration of Balance. It's a pretty complicated term for a fairly easily implemented test. It's where the patient is asked to stand and with eyes open, eyes closed, and they're standing on either stable, compliant, or unstable, non-compliant surfaces, and a score is provided based on what the patient's able to do. So Sarah, also, yeah. oh, I'm sorry, I was gonna say, Sarah, you know, many of these tests and measures um, might feel common, but some of them might be new. I know that depending on the university you went yeah. to, what organization you work for, some of these are more common and some of these are less common. Mm -hmm. Can you help share where, where clinicians can learn more about these? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in the next slide, we have an area where for APTA, if you are a member, you will have access to all aspects of the website. 
If you are not a member, you will have access to some. But as you go onto the APTA site and you go into patient care in your practice, you will have access to clinical practice guidelines. And in that area, it will identify various assessments, not just the ones that we had listed on the slide previous, that correlate to an impairment or diagnosis to help guide you. Now, not to fret if you don't have access to the APTA site or you're not a member, because there's also other sites like the Shirley Ryan Abilities Lab, where you can search a specific test and measure. The only thing in that site is it's unlike the APTA site that provides tests and measures for you as it correlates to a diagnosis or an ailment. The Shirley Ryan Abilities Lab has only a list of um, tests and measures. So you have to have a test and measure in mind that you're looking for, and it will pull that up for you. These are really amazing um, things to do because when you access the information on these tests and measures, you also pull up information around normative data, around what is a reasonable progression of a score. So for example, you may have um, a score, and we can go into this a little bit later, that for a Berg, you get a patient that has 17 out of 56, and you want to know what does that mean. If you pull up some of the clinometrics on these tests and measures that you find on these websites, it will help identify for you what that score means as far as the patient's abilities. So yeah, thanks, Tyler. Now, what, let's think about this in everyday practice. So we often see in everyday environments, we're out in the community and in our post-acute environment, patients performing a simple chair rise. It's a movement that we need to do for transfers. It's a movement we need to do to prepare for walking and ambulation. It's something we observe all the time. And I think as physical therapists, we sometimes so quickly identify different challenges a patient's having. Maybe nursing has told us that they're seeing a change in how Mr. Smith is getting up. Maybe they're observing that he's having more momentum that's required for him to weight shift forward. Maybe other staff are seeing a patient who never had a retro lean begin to retro lean or lean right side, left side. So when we start to observe how patients spontaneously performs an action, that's considered a movement observation. But a movement analysis, and we go to the next slide, Tyler, is where we take that a little step further. So movement analysis, we're really looking to see what is it that caused that patient to spontaneously move in a certain way. Now, there are courses on movement analysis and movement observation. We are certainly not going to do that today, but it's something that if it interests you, I encourage you to seek those out. So we have just a quick little example here of what we would do when we're synthesizing this information and observing our patient perform just a simple sit to stand. On the far left, you have that our patient needs to get the feet, their feet on the floor. Now to do that, we need to make sure, can they scoot forward? Can they weight shift? Do they have the knee and ankle range of motion to be able to get those feet flat? Are they up on their toes? How are they positioning and posturing? Then we move to where, as you start to move in the progression to sit to stand, patients need hip flexion with some lumbar and cervical extension. We need to move forward and then bring ourselves into an erect posture. Are they able to do that? What might limit that? You might want to consider weak abdominal muscles. Maybe there's an increased thoracic kyphosis going on there that's limiting that action. Then we move into movement of knees forward during execution. So we want to look to see what is the knee range? Does the patient have coordinated movement between concentric, eccentric work of the quads and hamstrings, the gluteals, the trunk extensors? What are some things that might be limiting the patient to actually execute this transition from that mid stance to full stance? And then in this full stance posture, we're looking for flexible hip flexors. You know, we, we consider again this post-acute environment where unfortunately a lot of our patients are in bed or in a wheelchair. They don't get up and move around too much. So we can imagine that those hip flexors are probably a little bit restricted. So we've worked through our evaluation. We've kind of been guided on the clinical pathway we want to take by getting a gathering of general information. 
that led us to our assessments. And the assessments can be functional tests and measures that we can find on our association or through sites like the Shirley Ryan Abilities Lab. And we are now need to work to determine what are the next steps? What's the plan? How do I attain my goals? How am I getting there? You know, the goals we set are the steps to get to that long-term best outcome for our patient. I alluded earlier that when you go into the APTA site or the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab or another site to pull up tests and measures or even provocation tests for the knee, the hip, the shoulder, you will get information about either a minimal clinical important change or a minimal um, detectable change. They're very similar. Um, one includes a score that accounts for any errors in testing, but in general, in general, these scores tell us how the patient is changing in their abilities. As the score improves, we think about a person perhaps at decreased risk for falls. So let me give you an example. We talked about the Berg earlier. I have a patient, I perform the Berg, and out of a total score of 56, they came up with a 14. We know that that's a big risk for falls. So I create a short-term goal that I want my patient to be a 27 out of 56 for a short-term goal. And, you know, and I think we can agree when we think of short-term goals, we think of something that's attainable within a two to maybe three week period of time or less. And when you look at the clinometrics, when you look at this MBC um, for Berg, it will tell you that a reasonable progression is about four, three to four points. Now, what we don't always get with these tests and measures is three to four points in what period of time. So we're going to estimate that that's probably within a two to four week period of time based on what the evidence shares with us. So perhaps a more reasonable goal for short term would be to go from a 14 out of 56 to maybe a 15, 16 or 17 out of 56 as a short term goal. You can certainly make your long term goal more attainable because we're talking about the Berg. We know that if we have a score of the mid to high 40 range out of 56, that usually indicates a decreased risk for recurrent falls. So I really encourage you to consider the clinometric sheets and pull those up to help guide you. Yeah, and listeners, when we, when we get to the Q&A section, I would love to hear from some of you as to how you've potentially incorporated the MCID and the MDC within your goal setting process. Sarah shared an, ex uh, an excellent example, but I'd love to hear from some of you all as well, so keep going with that. Yeah, thank you, Tyler. Now, one thing that our association recently incorporated as a practice guideline update was mild cognitive impairment. And we talked about this earlier as one of the components that may uh, be cause a patient to be at risk for falls. So one of the, the items they indicated, and I'll just read it, it's just really short, is that for patients for whom uh, a close contact voices concern about their memory or cognition, we should assess for a mild cognitive impairment and not assume that it's related to normal aging. Now, that's not to say that we as physical therapists need to be performing an ACL, as, which is an Allen cognitive level screen or a SLUMS or a CPT, which is a cognitive performance test. But it should guide us that this occurrence may require an assessment or a screen by one of our peers, one of our occupational therapy or um, speech pathology. So Todd, we can go to the next slide, please. They are, our peers in OT and speech are excellent in guiding us as to the patient's level of cognitive impairment and how we might approach them to be the most successful we can in getting their cooperation, collaboration, participation in therapeutic exercise, therapeutic activities, balance tasks, ambulation. I came to this company from an outpatient background and I will tell you I had a big learning curve because my instructions were very fast. I was not always in front of the patient delivering my instructions. And I found patients either became agitated, shut down, 
or just didn't know what to do. They were very confused. And so when I learned more about cognitive impairment and treatment approaches, I saw a big change to my treatment outcome, to the patient's participation, to them wanting to participate in activities and compliance and adherence to a program. There are so many resources out there. Allen Cognitive Levels have scores that directly correlate the treatment approaches for therapeutic exercise, therapeutic activities, balance tasks, walking. Tipa Snow is a free app you can get on your computer or your phone. And she is an OT who is remarkable. She highlights a cognitive impairment by gems. So um, depending upon the level of impairment, they may be an emerald or a pearl or a sapphire. And then she discusses how those people at various gem levels will respond to different approaches. And she even has little videos which are really amazing. So I encourage us as PTs who we don't have um, as much of that in our training in PT school and not always in the environments that we're, we're working in, I encourage you again to seek out um, and share information from our peers. They're great collaborators and they're always um, eager and happy to help guide us to a treatment approach for our patients. Um, and I think Shyla, we're going to go to the next. Um, Shyla, we'll go back one quick, if you don't mind. Shyla, we'll go into the next polling question. We'll give her a few moments to get that pulled up for everyone. So, to review, which of the following physical limitations increase the risk for falls in the older population? And I'll give you all a few moments to answer. We have loss of muscle mass, stiff joints, decreased proprioception, or all of the above. Okay, we'll close the poll. So, yay, 99% of you said all of the above. Excellent, that's exactly right. So Tyler, we'll go into the next slide. So inactivity and frailty, all of the above is absolutely correct. And we were just talking about cognitive impairment. And when you add mild to moderate cognitive impairment, along with strength deficits, mobility deficits, it really tends to isolate folks as we all saw through COVID, right? And so it just is going to exacerbate any frailty that they already have. So just to review, inactivity is absolutely a major cause of frailty. Being inactive, regardless of the reason, causes further weakness in all body systems. So when a person's not active, we see more loss of muscle mass. And we already saw that it's pretty significant, right? And some of our patients 80 and over, up to 30%. And the thought that after 30, we will start losing three to five to maybe even 8% of muscle mass is pretty eye-opening. But then we get the stiff joints, continued deficits in range, affecting cardiorespiratory system, why? which is why monitoring rate of perceived exertion is so important in this, in this uh, clientele of folks in post-acute environment, and just proprioception. And again, that joint proprioception, we have all seen be a major factor in falls as well, correct? So is there hope, right? Is there any chance of change that we can affect people in this community? Well, yeah, there is, which is great. Um, Bray et al. Uh, defines, and along with other research, that kind of created an amalgamation of concepts and conclusions that folks came to. But exercise is the medicine to reverse or mitigate frailty, preserve quality of life, and restore independent functioning in older adults at risk of frailty. The concern that most research indicates is that we tend to underdose this population. We tend to be concerned that, oh, that, that weight is too heavy, or oh, they can't move that area, or that's going to really cause them to be fatigued. So how do we exercise for the pre-frail or frail older adult? And Tyler, I know you've got some great ideas for people. Awesome. Thank you, Sarah. Really appreciate what you've covered. Um, you really laid the foundation for what I'm going to take over with here, and it's really a transition into the treatment interventions. Specifically, I'm going to be talking with you all about high-intensity training. This slide lays out some common indications, precautions, as well as contraindications 
But I really want to review this in a reverse order because, as Sarah mentioned, there's a lot of um, a lot of perceptions or misconceptions as it relates to uh, exercise dosing within the frail or the geriatric population. And as she as she stated, a lot of the geriatric patients and even clinicians in the geriatric space feel as if high intensity is too intense. But if you guys start by looking at the contraindications first, then moving towards indications, you could really likely find that more patients than not are appropriate for high intensity training. And the evidence really shows that high intensity training is effective for the, the geriatric population. So some common contraindications would be unstable um, angina, if they have an aneurysm, uncontrolled hypertension, or a pulmonary embolism. This isn't like the most all-encompassing list ever, but this is a pretty uh, concise list of contraindications. And as you're thinking through perhaps your patient caseload right now, you'll probably find that this doesn't make up a large percentage of your caseload. Then kind of scaling back into the precautions, you'll see if they have abdominal precautions. Let's say someone had a recent um, you know, surgical procedure to their abdomen, whether they have um, um, you know, a new uh, colostomy bag or some other different procedures in the abdominal region, you want to be cautious. You want to avoid any sort of valsalva maneuver that might increase that interabdominal pressure. You might have someone with like a, a single limb fracture, and then a precaution would be to avoid the high intensity activities to that limb itself. But the other side, the contralateral side, certainly could be appropriate for high intensity training. And then lastly, the indication list is pretty broad. Most of your patients likely fall uh, into one of the categories with an indication there, showing muscle weakness, balance deficits, declines in functional mobility, and frailty. Um, you know, of note, balance is on there. You know, a lot of us have utilized high intensity as it relates to strength, muscle weakness type activities, but with balance, um, this might be new. And we'll jump into some of that with you on the next upcoming slides as well. So this slide here covers some of the common methods to help find the proper intensity dosage. The most common out there in the literature is to aim for 80% of a one rep max. And many of you guys might be thinking, I'm not doing a one rep max test with some of my 90 year old patients, 80 year old patients. And I'll say from a clinician myself, I, I don't disagree. I, I don't routinely complete a one rep, uh, one rep max with my patients, but there's several other ways to help land on that appropriate 80% of the one rep max. My favorite and it's the most simple is to look at that first line there. It's aiming for eight repetitions to failure. Um, so if someone's completing eight repetitions of a very basic activity, let's use like a, a dumbbell curl, when they get to that eighth rep, if they're really starting to struggle and they might start to compensate, you're, you're at a good spot. But if they can complete greater than eight, then it's time to up the weight. Oftentimes I see um, patients completing just repetition after repetition that we might even lose count of how many repetitions they've done. Um, I've seen you know clinicians ask, how many was that? Um, I'm not sure, maybe 20 or so. You know, when that happens, you, you can be certain that the dosage is not correct if you're really aiming to improve strength. Um, this, this likely means you're gonna have to up the weight a lot more than you're used to. Some of the weights that you have in your clinic spaces might not be the right size weights for what you're trying to accomplish. You know, it's not uncommon to see small little ankle weights and you might not get to the proper dosage unless you layer some of those up or go for some of the bigger ones. Um, we can even apply this towards some other aspects of care. So the next one takes a look at balance and gait. If a patient is successful more than 80% of the time, it's time to increase that challenge. So think about gait or balance. If you're applying a balance challenge and they, and they are very rarely having to uh, um, complete some sort of a balance reaction, then you're underdosing them. But on the flip side, we can actually overdose as well. If, if a patient is having to complete a balance reaction, they're losing their balance, they're completing ankle and hip strategies on every single trial, then, then you may have to back it off a little bit because we want to help them learn um, the, the appropriate balance mechanisms instead of just learning to 
feel what it's like to fall. Next, we can look at rating of perceived exertion, particularly if we're doing any type of cardiovascular exercise, if we're, we're, we, can, we can incorporate this into gates as well, but really leaning on that same concept of 80%, or for, for this metric, leaning into the seven to eight on the zero to 10 scale for rating of perceived exertion. And I mentioned earlier that we may need to revisit what type of equipment we're using, but I also don't want to um, you know, steer too much towards the direction of the equipment because we can do a lot of great things we can dose our patients properly without without any equipment. You know, there's there's likely some home health clinicians on the call today, and when we get to the Q and A, it's a great chance for you guys to share what you guys do. But you don't oftentimes have any equipment, so you can look at some things like having our patients really slow down on that that eccentric phase, or you could lower the height of a surface, or sometimes raise the height of a surface. And then if you really want to get creative. Um, I've used this in the past and it's been tremendously helpful when utilizing these concepts with ADLs was a weighted vest, putting a weighted vest on our patients and having them complete some of their you know, dynamic ADL tasks is another great way to incorporate high intensity. Tyler, I've seen some therapists document momentary fatigue when they're doing high intensity training. Is that the same as the failure that you talked about? You know, um, momentary fatigue is, is a great, great indicator for if a patient is reaching sort of their, their threshold. So if, if they're encountering that momentary fatigue early, so after two or three reps, then, then you know that you're underdosing. And similarly, if that momentary fatigue doesn't come until a repetition 14 or 20, um, then you know that you're underdosing. Thank you. Yeah. So jumping in a little bit more deeply into balance and gates particularly because this is an area of, of practice that we don't as oftentimes think about high intensity training. Um, I do want to give some examples here, leaning back to that idea of 80% success, um, or this way it rewards it a little bit, um, trying to provide a dynamic challenge that leads to 20% or fewer errors. Um, as we're going through balance challenges, we can use a lot of different equipment to help us achieve this. We can use dynamic foam and different progressions with that. As we're doing balance strategies, we can alternate foot placement. We can have tandem stance. So many different things that we can do to help achieve this. But keep in mind that high intensity idea or concept as you're, you're aiming to progress your patient. We don't want to put someone on a foam pad if they're already having balance challenges on hard, a hard surface. You know, we, we wouldn't want to progress but we oftentimes struggle to know what, when should I progress? Is it just kind of a gut instinct? But this, this concept using that 80% um, is a great way to help you more objectively identify when to progress. That's a great point, Tyler, because I know I, myself included, you know, we often are so focused on the end game of walking that we forget about the, the things we need to do to get there um, and making sure that they're, they're able to do it without compensation. So. Thanks for reiterating that. Absolutely. And then lastly, on this at, on this screen, I'll talk about gait. Um, we can kind of fall into this pit of just trying to progress the distance all the time. But if our patient is requiring consistent cues to, to achieve appropriate gait mechanics, rather than trying to really progress that distance, we may need to pull back and focus on the quality of that gait. Um, but then, even once we get to the point where the gait quality is where we want it to be, don't always feel as if distance is the way to really progress a patient. We can look at things like adjusting the speed, um, operating some dual task, you know, placing some obstacles to really make the, the activity challenging. And you can really use that percent of cues a, as a way to really objectify the skill that you're providing as well as objectify some of that progression. So Sarah already hit um, on some of the ideas and uh, movement analysis around transfers. Um, I'm going to talk about transfers through the lens of a really functional high intensity training activity. Um, I, I spent many years in my career um, working in the home health environment and performing transfers was, wasn't always done to help a patient learn how to transfer because in, in the home health setting, 
when they're home, oftentimes they already know how to transfer, but they have some underlying impairments related to strength and balance. And I use the transfer task as a way to really improve their strength without having a whole lot of equipment. You know, looking around their home for which chair in the house is the hardest one for them to get up from. Is it that couch that they haven't used for two years because it's too squishy and too low? Well, finding those type of surfaces are going to allow you to still apply these concepts, but I want to lean back into the idea of how many repetitions until that momentary fatigue or that compensation. Um, and that's really that same eight repetitions. If they cannot complete eight sit to stands from whatever surface you're on, you likely need to find a different surface or artificially raise that surface so they can complete eight. Um, if, if you can't find a surface in the home that is challenging enough, let's say they can do 15 reps on every surface in the house or every surface in your clinic, then that's when you really look at varying uh, the speed or really slowing down that descent. Or I have listed here a weighted vest. A weighted vest is a great tool, but I know not everyone has access to a weighted vest, but using that with this task um, can be great. Um, but without that weighted vest, some other creative ideas would be even just taking some ankle weights or other different weighted objects that fit comfortably and appropriately and put, putting them in a gate belt. So finding different ways to provide the proper dosage. Um, but that's really what this that's really what this portion of the presentation is all about is finding that proper dosage. That's really how we're going to find and achieve the greatest possible impacts for our patient. So next, I want to jump into a case study, and I'll just kind of start by laying a little bit of the foundation. Um, this is a patient that both Sarah and I had a chance to interact with. Um, it was someone that um, really came a very long ways in a very short period of time because of high intensity training. I thought it'd be valuable to share this in effort to really pull it all together. So to share a little bit of information about this, um, this is a patient that we saw after they had already received a period of, of therapy. When we came on board, um, they were previously receiving two times a week therapy. Um, and we, um, we determined, you know, after I completed my reevaluation, really diving into those rehab measures that, you know, Sarah mentioned earlier in the presentation, um, I really recognized that he could benefit from five times a week therapy. So a pretty big change from from a frequency standpoint. Um, we also noticed as, as, as I completed a chart review that his therapy was being completed in a fairly low intensity mode um, and I transitioned him to high intensity. And then lastly, and this is a key component as well, transition from very low consistency, not a lot of regularity from therapists, not a lot of regularity with the follow through of the session over session, um, but then even just the number of sessions within a week. Um, we really put together a core team that was able to follow the progression and keep that progression going. Um, if some of you are on the call today or within this webinar are hungry to apply high intensity training, it is key to have really solid documentation as a, as a mechanism to provide that handoff to whoever might see them on that next session. Um, so the consistency uh, played a really key role here as well. So a little bit more about this patient. He was a 65 year old male who underwent a left total knee replacement June of 2021. Um, for reference, that was about six months, um, you know, from the point that he started to when we picked up. Um, the patient had been living in his own apartment prior to the surgery. He was modified independent with all of his mobility and ADLs. He did have a PCA that came in to assist with a few household tasks. So this you know, wasn't someone that lived you know, down the block in his own house. He had a little bit of help, but not with mobility, not with ADLs, mostly things like some household cleaning, things like that. Um, his surgery did have some complications. He did have an infection. Um, he also had some arthritis. Uh, in fact, the, um, the infection did become so poor, so aggressive that amputation was on the table. Um, he has diabetes, neuropathy, he was morbidly obese, um, and he did have a malignant neoplasm of, of nerves in his right upper limb. So his upper limbs also had some impairments. Um, so that's kind of painting the picture of 
of this individual. But as you look at the very bottom there, this was the most eye-opening to me because many of you guys might be in the same camp. I've treated many, many patients who have had total knee replacements. And if they require any type of mechanical lift for mobility, for transfers, it's, it's usually pretty short. And this individual was using a Hoyer for this entire six month post-op period. It's quite amazing, Tyler, that for six months, he received such a low dose of therapy and inconsistent right, uh, types of therapy. And I think that's an interesting point because I think a lot of us see our patients in whatever environment we're in that far post-op we, I don't want to say we give up, but I think we tend to be very guarded, right, with what we can do for that patient. So pretty interesting. Yeah, so I'm going to jump into the next poll question. There were some unique infection control considerations uh, during this window. So the question here for the poll is, due to infection control within this facility, this resident was unable to leave his room for several days. What are some high intensity interventions that could be performed if you're in a patient's room? Hmm. So I'll give you guys a minute to go ahead and answer that. All righty, we're at about the two thirds have uh, completed the poll and 76% of you guys are correct. Um, the answer there is bridges in bed with hold and a slow eccentric phase targeting failure at eight repetitions. So some of you guys may be thinking any one of those answers could have been right. I mean, if we're really targeting that eight reps to failure, that's really what we're aiming for here. But I wanted to highlight an example of how we can still apply this high intensity concept even when we're we're stuck in a patient's room and they're primarily stuck in their bed there's still some really great things that we can work on and it really brings me back to really the foundation of building a patient up before we move on too quickly this patient didn't spend a lot of time working on supine exercises really targeting failure where he was where he was able to they moved straight towards having him stand with like uh stand with different mechanical lifts and trying to do things like that, trying to push towards walking. Um, I think that really led to some of the, the pullback on the therapy provided is, you know, based off the documentation, it looked like they were scaling back because he wasn't progressing. But through my lens, he wasn't progressing because they, they didn't start at that foundation and really build up using the high intensity principles where he was able to and then move forward. So here are some interventions that, that I used with him. I did start with supine exercises, really trying to build that foundation, make sure he had the proper strength, the, the proper bed mobility before we really progressed too quickly towards ambulation. Active assist range of motion and facilitation te techniques, did some tapping, some other different facilitation techniques on that surgical leg that was very weak. He wasn't even at a three out of five level of strength on that surgical side six months out. So really helping him achieve his full available range of motion during those strengthening activities. Bridges in bed, but really, really once he got to that top, hold, holding it, slowing down and really controlling that eccentric phase, really trying to make sure that he was going as slow as he could to fail on that eighth rep. You know, sometimes he wanted to just push through and go quickly and he would do 12, 13, 15 reps, and that wasn't the target. I, I sometimes had to slow him down and really educate on this is what we're aiming to do. Um, he really wasn't able to stand up from any surface um, when I started with him. So what we started then with was mini stands from his raised bed. Um, a reminder, there were some infection control challenges, so we couldn't even get outside of the room um, early on. We couldn't use like a high-low mat in the gym. So I was able to thankfully have access to his hospital style bed so I could raise the bed up and really focus on the mini stands that he was able to complete eight successfully. Um, and lastly, standing with pre-gate weight shifts, um, really aiming for that 
um, physical assist for me on about 20 to 30 percent of the trials. So hopefully this kind of pulls together many different ways that you can apply the high intensity principles across balance, pre-gate, supine exercises, etc. So this was a pretty remarkable case. It was a case that um, you know I, I I reflect on quite a bit, especially as I thought about high intensity training. I mentioned that he he was basically essentially bed bound, Hoyer bound for six months, and within two weeks of really deploying these treatment strategies, the Hoyer was completely discharged. Um, this is an individual who went six months without walking. And again, within that two week period, he was ambulating short distances with the front wheel walker. He went from max assist with bed mobility. I think a big portion of that was they were using the Hoyer since he couldn't transfer. They, they kind of leaned, leaned on the Hoyer, but he went from max assist with bed mobility to standby assist. Um, and then towards the very tail end, this was a quote from him. Um, he said, I'm finally able to use my leg again. I'm going to walk out of here. To be very honest, when I started with him, he was very hopeless. He thought he was going to live in a nursing home for the rest of his life. And he was able to walk out of that facility. And he ended up going to an assisted living facility, which was a huge morale boost for him and really just a huge testament to the application of high intensity training and really just evidence based care. And if I remember, Chai, this was a bigger gentleman, correct? Like this wasn't a gentleman that was easy to maneuver around. He he needed a lot of strength gains to be able to walk out of that facility. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Pretty incredible. Thank you, Tyler. Yeah. So we're at the end of the formal presentation, and we we have ten or so minutes here to really cover any questions that you guys have. I believe I've seen that there may have been some questions that have already come through. So. Um, we can kind of go through and answer some of those, and um, we'd welcome you guys to come off mute and ask questions and share feedback and share some ideas that you've you've used in your own practice. Hey, Tyler, they aren't able to come off mute, but if you guys have any questions, you're able to use the questions feature, and I will go over them. I'll ask them, and you guys can answer. Um, there weren't any questions related to the content. Um, there is one coming in now. Can you speak to the use mm -hmm. of OmniCycle or New Step and making that a skilled intervention? Yeah, I'll jump into that one, Sarah. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've definitely seen this used very effectively by deploying these principles. And I would I would lean into the, the rating of perceived exertion. So really leaning on that, you know, asking the patient to to, to share on that RPE scale, how intense is this activity, leaning into that seven to eight on that zero to 10 scale. If they aren't on um, any heart rate controlling medications, you know, looking at their heart rate as well, aiming for similar to that 70 to 80% of a, of a max heart rate for them. But the RPE scale with the geriatric population is probably more, accu more accurate, just as we know so many of our patients are on beta blockers, and other medications that might um, artificially impact their, their heart rate. And one thing that I like to do, Tyler, is I have patients do some interval training. So maybe if they're on it for five minutes, they'll have a warm up of two minutes. And once every other minute, they'll start with five seconds as fast as they can, arms and or legs, whatever they're able to maneuver and move safely. And then a progression would be that perhaps they do go to 10 seconds. Maybe they do it. Um, instead of this for five minutes throughout their 10 minute time on the bike or on the cycle, maybe they increase to where they're doing it more frequently. So those are all nice, objective, measurable, uh, reproducible progressions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. Where do you typically put osteoporosis in your high intensity considerations? Yeah. So osteoporosis is not considered a contraindication. It would really fall within the precaution list. Um, you know, and even depending on if there's any specific, um, you know, recurrent fractures that you're, that this individual may have. If you have someone that has um, recurrent um, lumbar compression fractures, you may be a little bit um, careful on the types of loads you are, you're using, but osteoporosis mm -hmm. does not land in the camp of a contraindication. 
Yeah, and in fact, they've shown that you know isometric work and therapeutic exercise can actually improve the bone density no matter the age of the person. Now, nutrition obviously is a factor in that as well. And remember that you know when we do the high intensity, we're not talking about plyometric work, right? So we're not doing a lot of compression type of activities um, where they're getting some kind of ballistic component going. But that's a great question. Yeah, and I think that's that's one that we all have, right? In this environment, we're like, oh, I don't want to cause any more harm. So great question. Any specific recommendations for someone who is an extreme high risk of falls without making them feel bad as they insist on only using a quote unquote hurricane? I missed that. A hurricane did I hear? I'm not familiar with it. It's a quote unquote. I, I think they mean a cane. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking. <laughs> So, the, so, I'm sorry, can you repeat it one more time? So it's somebody who's very frail, who is high risk for falls, is that what I heard? Yes. Any okay. specific recommendations for someone who is an extreme high risk of falls without making them feel bad as they insist on only using a cane? I can start, Tyler, you can jump in. Um, you know, those folks, I usually just say, you know what, you have to bear with me. Let's start with you with some sitting tasks. Maybe we do some things in the parallel bars and just say we're going to be really challenging you. And if you're we're successful here, then we're going to go outside the parallel bars. So it's sometimes uh, with folks there may be, I'm not saying there's mild cognitive impairment, but just normal aging changes that occur as far as reasoning and understanding. And some people are just stubborn. But if we sometimes can show them where they are successful and then have uh, a goal for them to attain uh, where they move us away from the parallel bars or they move away from their hurricane, um, that can be good too. But I tell you, you can do some, when we, Tyler and I had the opportunity to participate in some training around this concept at some clinics and the creativity that therapists had using physio balls, using TheraBand, using Dynadis to challenge a patient uh, to stand while they were sitting even on a Dynadis. Um, really got the patient um, within what their cardiac meds, if they were on that, able to do, but they got that heart rate up, they got some shortness of breath, they got to that high intensity area, and patients um, didn't question too much, you know, why am I not doing this versus this? What we tended to see more of, I want to also do what they're doing. And I don't know what you observed, Tyler, was something like that. Well, the, the point I was going to add is I, I actually really enjoy when patients come to me and have those requests because that means they're motivated for something. I want my patients mm -hmm. to have something they're striving mm -hmm. for. And if that cane is something that they're striving for, help lay out some parameters that allow them to do that safely. So whether it's they use the walker without you and then you use the cane with them until they do X, Y, Z, whether it's mm -hmm. a certain bird balance score or a certain score on the short physical performance battery, or even you know going back to this presentation, until you can walk this, you know, obstacle course without losing your balance, you know, X number of times, come up with some objective parameters to help them push hard to really improve their balance and allow them to really strive for that as a goal. Yep, I've seen some therapists have a scorecard in patients' rooms or on their phone to show them their progression and that worked nicely too. Mm -hmm. Working in home health, I've not seen patients five times a week. How do you get that frequency approved for patients that need that much? So, I'll, I mean, going back to that case study, that case study was in a skilled nursing facility setting. I would say the concepts of high intensity don't need to be linked to the, the frequency of care. This patient particularly, he needed that and he wouldn't have been safe to be in their home. But hopefully if they're already in their home, they're at a certain level of functional mobility that they they can carry out and do some things between sessions. They can have some home exercises that you provide them that they can still receive five plus days of exercise. But I definitely am aware of the, the you know, some of the challenges from a reimbursement standpoint, looking at PDGM, we're really being asked to achieve the best possible outcomes while managing the number of visits. So more than ever you can use those high intensity concepts while you're there but i don't think you would need to see someone five times a week to to achieve strong outcomes and, and i think too in the home health environment if you're concerned about them doing 
some of these high intensity things and standing. I mean, there's, as Tyler pointed out, you can get them to momentary fatigue with bed mobility exercises or laying on the couch exercises. So that's, that's where the challenge is for us, which is a fun challenge. Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite or recommend a weighted vest to look into purchasing? Boy, I, I could dig in my closet. I think I have one in there. I, um, I'm not sure if we have like an email participant list, but um, I do have some information. We actually, ours was purchased as part of a, a project we were involved in, but I believe it was purchased on Amazon. And I guess I don't mm -hmm. remember the, the brand of it, but it wasn't overly expensive. It wasn't overly complex. It was a vest that had several slots. I think there were like four slots on the front, four slots on the back, where you could then put in these like individual like three pound tubes so you could mm -hmm. customize the weight to fit what you needed. Um, I wouldn't recommend something that is a static single weight. So let's say it's a 15 pound weighted vest. I think you'd find um, you're not gonna be able to dose correctly. So I don't know the brand name, but look for something that you could change out the weights um, to customize it for the activity. And that has Velcro, you know, straps to accommodate various girths. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, Shyla? Okay. I don't see any yet. I'm waiting a couple okay. more seconds to see if any more come sure. through. Um, one that is saying, I noticed the webinar is being recorded, would like to make sure my PTAs see this. Will this recording be available on a certain site? My care. Um, if you are an Aegis employee, it will be um, available on SharePoint. And there is a SharePoint in the clinical field resources, noted impact with Aegis and all of our recordings are stored there. One more, how did you start implementing this? Sometimes starting something new is the hardest part. So, I mean, leaning really back into when Sarah and I first dove all the way in, because I, I think knowing Sarah and Sarah knowing me, we've, uh, we've deployed aspects of high intensity training throughout our entire career. But when we really wanted to implement a more wide sweeping change, we, we yeah. had meetings with our team. We provided training on the precautions, contraindications, indications. And then lastly, we came up with a mechanism. And this was, I think this was Sarah's idea to really help us ensure anyone that carried through with high intensity, they, they were able to very quickly identify and know if they were on on like an approved high intensity um, training protocol. So maybe I'll lean into you, Sarah. You, you had an idea um, for identifying patients and how we documented that. I believe um, they documented right. it somewhere. Right, so we were able to document that in, uh, you know, we had a different document documentation system at that time. We had Kasamba and we were able to identify, hit a little button that indicated they were high intensity and that would cue um, a PRN therapist, right, or an, a therapist who's not normally in the building, someone who may have been on vacation when we initiated the program to um, do that. Now, you can always discuss this with your teams, right? We're not saying this is the way to do it, but one option might be to, um, you know, we can't really flag patients, right, because we can't mark them in a unique way, but you can maybe indicate it in precautions. That's what we started doing. We started documenting it under precautions that this patient is appropriate for high intensity training. And then we would indicate um, if there was a precaution, except for right upper extremity, you know, or except for fill in the blank. Or we would even document in that area, appropriate for high intensity training in one week starting and put the date. So for example, one of the contraindications is uh, post heart attack, a recent myocardial infarct infarction. We have to wait a series of a specific number of weeks. Uh, I think it's, five to six weeks, correct me if I'm wrong, Tyler, I think it's in that area. And so once uh, that time period was cleared, then we could start that program. So that's what we did, and um, it worked pretty well. It, it became, though, a part of normal integration for all patients who were appropriate, even patients who with dementia. 
Um, and we just would incorporate more functional tasks for those folks. And it worked out very, very well. I would challenge you to start with one person and somebody who you think might be more compliant, who might be more eager to participate, and just feel comfortable. Get your feet wet, get started maybe on one activity. Maybe you take it to where, you know what, we're going to do um, interval training when you're on the bicycle today, or we're going to do interval training while you fold clothes today or push your walker. We're going to put a weight on your walker. And I'll tell you, I've done that with a lot of people. They're like, oh, this was great. I feel like I'm out of breath. I feel like I really got a good workout today. So just those little things you add um, make it easy to then integrate into other tasks. So it's hard jumping in with everything, but maybe pick one task, one patient, and see how you do. And um, I am so glad somebody asked about their physical therapist assistance. I, we would be nowhere without our physical therapist assistants as treating EPTs and, and ours because they're the ones, boots on the ground, that are treating our patients the majority of the time. And so um, I thank you for bringing those folks into this and integrating them into the process as well. And, you know, the, I will tell you, and Tyler can probably share this as well, people therapists and patients who integrated these concepts had more fun in therapy. They enjoyed coming down. We saw patients encouraging each other, um, you know, incorporating some of these things into group tasks, which was amazing. And so you're, you're limited by your own imagination. I mean, we added weights to vacuums. We added weights to wrists. We added weights while they were on the bike to their wrists and to their legs to increase the challenge if it was hard to get an interval component. Um, but for that, I'm thinking back to that patient with the cane and progression. I'll tell you, those Dyna discs, they're $13. Um, using physio balls as challenges while they're sitting or in a, a safe posture to challenge them really kind of opens also their eyes as to where they are and where they need to be to be able to use a device that requires, that doesn't look like a walker, right? That looks more normal. I hate to say that word, but more normal than the environment that they're used to being in. So. Pick one patient, one task, and see how it goes. Okay, uh, we have time for one more question and then we'll wrap it up. Um, how long are the sessions for patients that you implement a high intensity training program? Are they usually shorter? Yeah, so um, we found that the sessions actually did become a little bit shorter because we helped our patients achieve fatigue more quickly than if we weren't doing high intensity training. So it depends on the activity, whether you are incorporating some ADLs and then you're doing some balanced tasks or um, the way you construct your session, it doesn't always have an impact on the time. But we were finding and I was personally finding that the sessions ended up being a little bit shorter because we, we achieved fatigue a little bit more quickly. And I did have a therapist um, who was participating in the high intensity program. She said the name of the weighted vest was RUN, R-U-N, MAX. So thank you, you know who you are out there. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, that is all the questions and that wraps up our time. We're little bit over so thank you all for joining sarah tyler thank you for presenting and uh, we will see you next time thank you everyone thanks tyler thank you sarah thanks everyone thanks. bye bye, bye.